Now, I'm going to go out on a whim here and assume that a lot of you are familiar with a show called Top Gear, the show in which three middle-aged men reviewed, tested, and destroyed cars on the weekly. Sure, the car versus public transport races were great, and the cheap car challenges were always a source of entertainment, as well as an insight into the genius of Jeremy Clarkson. Sometimes my genius is... It's almost frightening. Whoa. But some of my more favourite moments from the show include the history rundowns of certain car makers. One that particularly stands to mind was that of Lancia. Yeah, that's the correct pronunciation. I think. In that piece, Clarkson and Hammond emphasised the greatness of the brand, claiming it to have produced more great cars in history than any other manufacturer in the world. The Stratos, the Delta Integrale, the O37. This whole piece made me fall in love with Lancia. It made me realise what a brand it was. And then on the Grand Tour, Clarkson detailed the intense battle for the 1983 World Rally Championship between Audi and Lancia, about how Lancia took on the might of the Audi Quattro and its squadron of drivers to win the World Rally Championship. These two pieces of film may convince you to go out and buy your very own lunch here, only to discover that the company has now descended to the bottom of the food chain, going from producing world-beating rally cars in the 70s and the 80s, to producing a rebadged Fiat 500 with a name made out of spare scrabble tiles. What happened to this brand? Well, let's take a look. Nineteen oh six was a unique year for Italy. This was the year where Mount Vesuvius threw a sh fit. Again. The nation ran through prime ministers like Mustangs ran through people. And in May that year, saw the inaugural running of the Targa Florio. It was only a three lap race, but each lap was over 92 miles long. Thus, it took Alessandro Cargo nine and a half hours to win the first Targa Florio. On the entry list for that year's event was one Vincenzo Lancia. He was quite a fast driver and highly regarded by Fiat. But by the end of 1906, he had his eyes set on his own car company. Because why not? Along with his friend Claudio, the company that we would know today as Lancia was formed. Its first car was the Tipo 51, or as it would later be known, the Lancia Alpha. Try wrapping your head around that piece of Italian brilliance. This car gained a reputation on the racing scene, as did the brand itself, which would play a fundamental role in its future years. Something else that the brand was known for was the push for innovation. The Lambda, for example, was the first car to be designed with a monocoque chassis and came with independent suspension. The Theta was the first European production car to have a fully electric system as standard. The Series 3 Idea was the first car to have a 5-speed gearbox. They were among the first to design a car using a wind tunnel with the Aprilia. They were the first to sell a production car with a V4 and V6 engine. Obviously, not in the exact same car, but twinning two lots of power together was pretty much what they did with the Delta S4, which was turbocharged and supercharged. All this innovative doings meant that the cost of production went up, as did the sticker price of the cars themselves. The plateauing demand for cars was decidedly unhealthy for Vincenzo Lancia, who died of a heart attack in 1937. Control of the company was given to his son Gianni, and after the World Cup had ended, he brought on board former Alfa Romeo designer Vittorio Giano. It was with this man that the Aurelia was born, which was the first production car to have a V6 engine. It proved to be quite successful in the motor racing scene, which was the primary focus for Gianni Lancia, who also decided that one way to cure their financial woes was to pour more money into their racing program and take part in the frugal world of Formula One. The D50 was Lancia's first and only attempt at creating a Formula 1 car. Making its debut in 1954, Lancia carried on its will for innovation. It was a little odd in shape compared to the likes of the Maserati 250F, but these features helped it secure pole position in its maiden race at the hands of the fastest warthog that ever graced land. But while he would score the fastest lap of the race, the D50 would not survive past lap 10, with the clutch having sort of died. Things looked promising heading into 1955, with Ascari keeping up with the mighty combo of Juan Manuel Fangio and Mercedes. But after Ascari died while testing at Monza, Lancia's efforts in Formula 1 were dwindled. Despite some good results coming in from Eugenio Castellotti, Lancia was starting to struggle quite badly financially. Their push to make a car as good as a car can be was crippling them. By the end of 1956, their Formula 1 assets were sold to Ferrari, and the company itself was sold to the Pacenti family. Despite this, the company still lose money 
well into the 60s, a solution was needed to be found. And perhaps, rather fittingly, Fiat launched a bid to take over the company at the end of the 60s. With the massive financial losses incurred that year, the Pacentis handed the keys over to Fiat, essentially saying, ha, huh, if you can get this thing to work, good f***ing luck, mate. Well, out of this marriage came cars like the Gamma, the Beta, the Stratos. All three were quite well received, and the Stratos in particular highlighted Lancia's continued foray into motor racing. We've already delved over their Formula 1 forays, but in addition to this, they had also achieved quite a bit of success in series such as the DRM series in Germany. But where Lancia made their mark was on the rally scene. They achieved success with the Fulvia, winning the manufacturer's title in 1972. But when they brought along the Stratos in 1974, the trophies really started to stack up. It boasted a Ferrari V6, and the short wheelbase setup meant that it handled like a dream. Now, here's where I'm going to cinema since the Grand Tour's larger car park story a little bit. Back in the time of the Stratos, the Group 4 rallying rules dictated that 400 road legal examples of the car that you were entering were required. But in their eagerness to get going, Lancia had only produced 200 examples at the time of the inspection from World Rally officials. So, not the 037, but the Stratos. The part of them using lunch as a diversion while they reparked the cars. That actually did happen. Because Lancia. The Stratos would help Lancia win the World Manufacturer's title in 1974, 1975, and 1976. It carried on winning rallies until the Group B monsters such as the Audi Quattro delivered a hammer blow to anything that wasn't four-wheel drive or produced 79 million brake horsepower. But for the 1983 season, Lancia turned up with the oh-so-amazing O37. The O standing for, oh my god, this car is f***. Nice. But despite the supercharged inline four cylinder producing 325 brake horsepower, all that power was sent to the rear wheels only. It was kind of an outcast, with almost everyone else having followed the lead of Audi. Now, I'll explain this rivalry in depth in another video, but to cut to the chase, the O37, as well as the immense driving skill from drivers such as Walter Rawl, and some ingenious ideas from the head of Lancia's rally division, helped Lancia capture the manufacturer's title against the might of that Audi outfit. While the O37 hung around in the championship for a further three years, it just couldn't keep up with the other Group B cars as their development ensued. But when 1987 came around, motor racing's biggest headache, Jean-Marie Ballest, banned Group B rally cars on safety grounds. Now, while Group B cars were spectacular to watch and were developing biblical amounts of power, they were only extremely dangerous. Thus, Group A rules were initiated with a new set of regulations for the manufacturers of the world to tackle. Lancia turned up to the first round of the 1987 season with the Delta S4 and it won everything in its path. It won the World Manufacturers Championship in 1987, 1988, 1989, 1990, 1991, and 1992. It all seemed to be going well for the Italian brand, but away from the rallying scene, back on planet Earth, things were a little bit grim. With regards to their production cars, most of their cars were pretty much rebadged Fiat's, and the issue of them turning to rust with the slightest amount of moisture in the air gave Lancia a reputation for building rust-prone burdens destined for the scrap heap. Sales plummeted with the beta recall being particularly damaging to the UK market. Of course today, Lancia's range consists only of one car. The y y Despite having the stupidest name attached to a car next to the Honda logo, it was the second best selling car in Italy in 2019 and continues to sell in impressive numbers today despite the end of the world happening right now. But from developing innovative cars for the road that would take on the might of the world's largest and most well-funded manufacturers to selling rebadged Fiat 500s, it's a very far cry from what this company used to be. On the 115th anniversary of the company's inception, a recovery plan was put in place for the brand, with Jean-Pierre Polo being employed as the chief designer and hired the Italian Jason Statham as the brand's new leader. It's set for the year 2024. Lancia models will be developed jointly with Alfa Romeo and DS. What does this mean? I mean, I have no idea, because I know nothing about cars. Obviously. What I do hope for, rather selfishly, is a rejuvenation of the Lancia Rally program. Maybe not a works team, but at least a customer car for, you know, customers. I realize this makes little financial sense when the company only really sells in one country and is doing perfectly fine sales-wise in it. But Rally is a part of Lancia's identity, as is innovation, which is also something that was kind of lost. Sure, the Yips is not a bad car, but it's hardly something in line with Lancia's earlier creations, which were teeming with new ideas and a will to push 
the automotive industry further ahead. Okay, maybe a bit overstretched. But while it is a dream to see Lancia return to their ways, it was ultimately what led to their initial downfall. Pushing the envelope in this industry will almost certainly come at a cost financially. And it doesn't particularly help when the car would change shape overnight, depending upon what time the neighbor put the sprinkler on. It's all a bit of a pipe dream, I know, fueled mainly by those aforementioned stories from Top Gear and the Grand Tour. But hopefully, with Lancia's new parent company, some of the ethos of the Lancia of old can be rediscovered. Or it won't be and they'll go bust, because my videos tend to age that way. Anyways, thank you all for watching. Drop a comment below, subscribe to the channel if you're awesome, and always remember, keep it respectful, be wholesome, don't be a manus, and as always, I'll see you all later.